you guys have been very, very involved, of course, with the PvP in uh, the Division 1 as well. But when you sat down for the first time and kind of, okay, what's our philosophy? What's our goals mm. moving for PvP in the Division 2? What was your first thoughts? Good question. The first thought was fairness. I'd say that probably the second thought that came out right after that was inclusion. We want more people to play PvP in the Division 2. Yeah, I think we made a lot of strides. Um, you know, throughout post-launch in the first game, taking a lot of those learnings and and really pushing fairness and uh, a place for everyone to PvP. What is exactly normalization? And how do you approach it in the Division 2? Yeah, that's a big topic. Yeah. Normalization was, um, it was very important for us with fairness and inclusion as, you know, two of the big pillars for PvP. Uh, and it was something we knew we needed to include because... Uh, although we are an RPG, uh, we also want players to be able to participate in gun battles, you know, that they feel are fair. And um, when you have a game with such stat diversity like we do, it was um, sort of a yeah, it's a no pretty, brainer. It's a super important layer. But you know, I think what you pointed out, right? We had uh, the the concept of normalization in the first game, but that's the that's the key thing. Is normalization is just an idea and you can apply it in all sorts of different ways. So we've completely redone uh, our normalization system from the first game to work with all the improvements to the RPG uh, that are in the Division 2. That was super cool for us to be able to have the Occupied yeah. Dark Zones, a place where we can say in contrast to you know the normal Dark Zones and organized PvP, okay, here you go. Um, you, have the, you have your full uh, statistical advantage that you've spent a lot of time working on. Go have fun together. Go play with each other. Shoot each other. Yeah. yeah, and then you know that core idea of normalization this time is, you know, we're not we're not just pushing everyone to the exact same power level. We're we're taking your build and making it still really matter. But we're kind of getting rid of those really high peaks of damage output and those really high sustainability builds and pulling everyone a little bit more in focus. I think it's important to note too that. Um, I mean, there are a lot of details to this yeah. normalization plan that we haven't discussed yet, but um, just imagine that um, if, if we're setting a bar for normalization, if you're under that bar, we help you move up to the bar. And if you're over that bar, um, players that are over that normalization standard position, you're going to you're going to receive some statistical bonuses um for being over and they're not huge advantages but they are in fact advantages and they make they make your time and your build and your choices still matter right yeah. still uh be felt yeah and i think one thing that i think you should talk about keith is the fact that um this normalization allows us to keep pvp and pve separate yeah i think that's one of the the core yeah, but... things uh is normalization isn't just changing the stats uh blanketly on your gear it's now it's going in and doing um, talent overrides just for normalized play or skill adjustments just for override um, just for normal normalized play with the idea of keeping pvp in balance but never affecting the pve game we want to give you all that power in pve we should talk to redstorm about these things and one of them sure, is yeah. the the voip uh questions people have been mm -hmm. having so for voip actually you know we're very engaged in the conversation right now. We know there's an active discussion in the, yeah. in the community. We're paying attention to all those conversations. It's wonderful, in fact, to be able to have the conversations now. You know, we're very open to um, making changes and adjustments uh, so the community is happy. The point is, okay, how, how can we help um, curb some of that toxicity that we had in the yeah. original game? Yeah, absolutely. It's like what you said before. It's about the inclusiveness uh, of mm -hmm. the experience and getting more people to come in giving you all the tools of the last game and stripping out some of the, the toxicity. Yeah, we're very aware that there's a lot of great relationships that happen in the dark zone, especially that ad hoc stuff. You didn't expect to yes. meet a person and then you had some great teamwork. We don't want to take that away at all. That's part of the very unique nature of the dark zone that all of us identify uh, as very important. Yeah. But we also want to try and steer our players away from um, the feeling that it's a bully community mm -hmm. and how can we help people feel comfortable, more comfortable, uh, without taking away some of the magic? So yeah. it's an iterative process. Like always, we're going to pay attention to how the community feels and um, how we feel and, and move from there. Let's talk, though, about the, the two different modes uh, that the game is launching with. Uh, it's Skirmish, we know, 
uh, slightly from the first game, and of course, uh, domination. But let's let's talk about skirmish first. Uh, it's a classic making its return, but there's there's been tweaks to the formula. Yeah, absolutely, there have been. Uh, I think maybe skirmish by name is about the only thing we took. Um, the design team and Keith worked hard to sort of reimagine what skirmish was. Yeah, and there were a couple goals that we that we had in mind, right? And the the main one is we wanted to make it a more team based tactical experience, but still obviously at its core, team deathmatch. So this time, instead of just trying to rack up kills as fast as possible, you have a set number of respawns, and you're trying to deplete the other team's respawns. And just that little mental shift makes you hang back, fight more as a team, uh, makes you care more about each death. Um, and it allowed us to do something that I think is really exciting, which is once the respawns are depleted, it kicks you into a team elimination phase. And it has this feeling of you're never completely out of the fight, right? You might be all the way down into the elimination phase. It's just you and one buddy. And, you know, if you you can stage a comeback from that point and, and deplete all the other team's respawns, get those final eliminations and still win. It just feels a lot more like we have exciting comebacks and uh, really tactical team-based play. Yeah, you're not just moving towards a frag count. Yeah. And we put a lot of work into the spectator cam. Uh, the team crushed it and... Uh, there's a real fun element to getting into that sort of elimination oh, yeah. where you get to watch your teammates and uh, and see them really shine and see them rally. Yeah. Yep. One thing we had in actually had in in last stand, for example, in the first games are are the boosts that are available to you scattered throughout the map. Can you tell us a little bit about those and how they work? Yeah. Go for it, Keith. Yeah. So uh, the idea is across the whole conflict, which is kind of the the platform for these PvP game modes. We want to have some connecting ideas, and one of those are the boosts. So in all these modes, um, you'll have these passive perks that can come online that you can go claim as an objective for your team. And you don't know exactly what you're going to get out of it, but it's going to give you some little advantage. In Domination, it might increase your score count. In uh, Team Deathmatch, it might give you extra armor for a little bit across your whole team. And it's just these little ways to augment the fight uh, and make it Honestly, it just kind of ups the excitement level. You can be, um, you know, maybe behind by a little bit, get one of these boosts and pull yourself back into the fight. They're tertiary objectives. It's, yep. it's meant to just supplement the main gameplay loops that are happening, but they're on the sides. You yep. know, you might have an active boost. You can pick it up and help your team. So the specializations are obviously, it's, it's a huge new um, part of the whole PvP or um, RPG progression that comes in at Endgame. We... We know, A, they're super powerful. They're meant to be really powerful. And we didn't want to take those away from you in PvP. We want to give you moments to use them. But we've changed the way that you get that special ammo and made it kind of a real tactical component that's integrated straight into uh, the conflict game mode. Yeah. We didn't want people just to come in with their specs and just crush. We didn't yeah. want PvP to be just about, OK, what's the best specialization weapon? I'm just going to use that the whole time. Yeah. So. You'll start the match, you'll have your specialization weapon on your back once you're at level 30. You can even see what specializations are equipped on the opposing team and on your team uh, up at the top of the screen. Um, so you can kind of plan uh, what might happen in the battle. Um, but you're only going to get that specialization ammo uh, a few key times in the match. And it will actually airdrop in uh, like a supply drop uh, from the Dark Zone. And both teams can fight over control of that. The winning team gets a little bit of specialization ammo for their whole uh, squad. But the really interesting part is if you can get in there and wipe out the other team, they drop any specialization ammo they had, and your team can try to take it back, kind of swing the fight. One thing you also had the opportunity to do when you sat down and started working on the PvP for the second game was, if we look at the first game, if we look at Skirmish, those maps are actually taken from parts of, of the world. But here you had a chance to start from scratch. You were able to build custom map from the ground up. Ground up. Yeah, the, the PvP experience um, as a starting pillar, you know, included from the get-go. How do you make the best PvP experience? Well, it starts with the maps. And we knew that this was the perfect time for us to get the LDs and the LAs and the level designers and the level artists in there and um, make real PvP maps for the first time in the division. Yeah, there's no... Uh, <clears throat> Nothing here where you're kind of serving two very different types of gameplay, right? So every decision that's made from the level design standpoint is all about what's going to create fair, tactical PvP. And it allows us to explore some spaces that aren't inside the, uh, the rest of the DC space. 
time to kill. Mm -hmm. And how does that differ in in because fights in in the first game can get quite long. So how does that mm -hmm. work in the second game? How did you approach that? We wanted players be, to be able to. I'm going to just say a term we used here. We wanted players to be able to outmap each other. Yeah. So flanking <clears throat> and you know map tactics and team tactics. We wanted it to matter. So often, um, you know, it was common in the, in the dark zone and in some of the later skirmish maps to you know successfully flank a person and then because of the mechanics we used, um, maybe the kill didn't happen as you had anticipated. And now with kill times, how they're, how, how they're currently being set, um, you can absolutely get the jump on someone and get the kill. Yeah, there's just because of like the core <laughs> changes to the feel of combat uh, across the entire Division Two experience, there were just so many little changes that improved PvP overall. So I think gunplay feels really awesome. Um, it's, uh, it has a real impact to it, and the time to kill damage is just higher in general. Um, a lot of the just healing in general is so reworked from the first game. So there's no instant pop heals. There's no, I was almost dead, but then I popped an instant heal and I'm right back in the fight, right? Healing is is always over time, and you really have to get safe and get in cover to successfully pull off those kind of clutch heal moments. And it lets the fights actually resolve, uh, and it feels really good. Yeah, there's no doubt that PvP... Um, well, of course, you can run up and try to face tank. Sure. Uh, and this is uh, an RPG, and there are skills. And, and there, there are shotguns. You don't want to get in there. Guns. Yeah. Um, but you better use cover. The idea, you know, domination, I think everyone kind of understands how it works. Um, and we have a lot of those tried and true mechanics, right? You get inside the zone. The more people you have inside the zone, you're going to capture faster. You can overtake the other team. But there's another component to... Um, capturing objectives in this game, which I think is really interesting. And it's this active capture. So you can, you know, rush into the middle and actually interact on the crate and you can steal it much faster and kind of overtake it from another team, even if they were inside of it. So you can try to sneak in um, or maybe you've cleared out the other team and you want to capture it really quick before they get back into the fight. And it adds this other layer of decision making that I think really uh, kind of elevates uh, this version of domination. Yeah, it feels really good to be able to have choice with the domination yeah. point and how you want to approach it as a team. You want to sit back, take cover, you know, go passive. You want to cover a man who's going to run in and try to actively capture it. Of course, you're exposed when you're actively capturing. We've done a lot of things to the spawn system to try to improve it from the first game. You'll notice the the wave spawn makes it. You know, you'll you'll die, and you might have. 10, 15 seconds to wait until that next uh, spawn wave comes in, but it lets your group kind of group back up, all come back in together, do a really focused push back into the match. Um, and then we've also done a lot of stuff to, you know, alleviate spawn camping and try to to just make it a better overall PvP experience. So um, each, all the maps have spawn flipping integrated. So if a team pushes too far into your uh, spawn area or you, there's too many kills inside the spawn area, that'll flip. And it kind of just keeps the matches more balanced, gets rid of these really runaway, um, you know, mm -hmm. 10 to 2 sort of matches. Well, it's a skill based matchmaking system. Um, I know Keith is probably going to talk about this, but we've, you know, we've, we're a part of the wonderful organization of Ubisoft, and we had the opportunity to really talk to a lot of other teams, how they use matchmaking and, and the strong parts about it. And we've integrated a lot of those learnings into the division PvP. So, um, for from a you know a, a vision or a direction standpoint, I wanted to make sure that players always felt comfortable that they were playing against people near their skill level, um, and skill-based matchmaking was the obvious choice. Yeah, and it's it's very different from from what we did before. Uh, we've kind of focused it down um, so that your wins and your losses really matter, and that's going to you know change who you're playing with. Um, and you know the goal is after this game's out in the wild just for a little bit. Uh, you'll start getting really, really much more balanced matches. Yep.